I've just leaned so heavily on my ear for as long as I, you know, have been doing music. And, you know, I think that's what I always try to encourage younger players to to just really work on developing your your ear. I, I just think there's a lot of freedom in following your ear as opposed to following your fingers. Welcome to the Acoustic Guitar Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Grizzle, joined for this episode by co-host Jeffrey Pepper Rogers. In this episode, we had the great privilege to spend time talking with Sarah Jarose. Jarose is an acclaimed singer-songwriter who has won three Grammys for her solo work, plus another as a member of the supergroup I'm With Her. Widely hailed as a child prodigy when she first came on the scene, both as a musician and a songwriter, Jarose continues to reach new heights. Her music has traditional roots, but after years of writing and performing, plus studying at the New England Conservatory, collaborating with other talented artists, and, of course, an emphasis on following her ear, Jarose has blazed her own trail in the acoustic music world. To support the Acoustic Guitar Podcast, please visit patreon.com slash acousticguitarplus, or check the show notes for more information. A big thanks to everybody listening who has already joined the community. We really appreciate it. In this episode, we discuss Jarose's unique songwriting process, her evolution as a multi-instrumentalist, and, of course, the guitars and other instruments she plays. Let's begin with the gear. I've always been a Collings girl, um, probably because, um, you know, Wimberley, Texas, where I grew up, is one town over from Dripping Springs, where the Collings factory is um from a very early age just from going to local events around the hill country i met steve mccrary um and bill collings but steve became sort of an instant family friend to to me and and my mom and dad and just very very supportive and kind even when i was 10 and like just getting started my way into collings was through the mandolin because i first got a mandolin from them in uh want to say 2003, I got a F5 mandolin um, that was maybe a year old at that point. Then through sort of, you know, getting to know Steve better and and realizing that I really loved Collings instruments, I got a a D1A um, guitar from them that was my touring guitar forever until very recently um, I switched to a, a double O guitar from them because I just wanted a little smaller body thing and I was doing a lot of finger picking on world on the ground and it's sort of for a live setting the the double o just kind of seemed to be better for going between strumming and finger picking so I love both of those guitars so much that it's it's funny that my original d1a which I still love and have actually been playing a lot more in the last few months was one of two guitars that they made for David Bromberg's 60th birthday (laughs) and it was the one that he didn't want so I don't know what that means but I loved it I it was sort of like an immediate um connection that I had with that guitar and um yeah I'll never I'll never get rid of that guitar it's got a lot of a lot of sentimentality for me just you know a lot of my first gigs that I ever played around Austin I use that guitar and definitely love my callings instruments um and then I can't not talk about Fletcher Brock Uh, I know it's not a guitar but it's my octave mandolin and um it's like my soulmate of an instrument you know I really feel like I was able to you know after my initial teen years of starting to write songs um it wasn't really until I got the octave mandolin that I feel like I was like this my world is opened now like this is what I've been waiting for this is how I can find my sound and uh yeah I actually just got like uh 
two weeks ago, I just got a second Fletcher Brock octave because I started just feeling like if anything happens to this, I, I don't know. I don't know what I would do with myself. So I, I have to have some sort of backup. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very special instrument to me. What was it about guitar that made you feel more comfortable writing songs? Well, I think, you know, because I started on mandolin and I, I had written stuff on the mandolin. It was just all instrumental. Um, you know, I think there was something about the guitar that the range being different than my vocal range, um, like generally just lower and and in feel and um, tone, I think there was like a balancing act there that made me more drawn to singing on top of it as opposed to with the mandolin um, kind of all being in the same zone. It just didn't seem to to be as balanced. And so I think that was maybe the initial thing, um, just that balance of range. But also um, my mom played guitar and, and still plays guitar as, as a hobby. And so I think a lot of it was just as a young girl kind of seeing her write songs on the guitar and just associating songwriting with the guitar because of her. Um, whereas, you know, when I was getting really into the mandolin initially, I was just obsessed with it on an instrumental level. And so, yeah, that, that, I think that's why the guitar sort of led me down the songwriting track. And then eventually when I got my octave mandolin, it was like the best of both worlds because, um, it had the lower range that the guitar sort of provided me when, when songwriting, but, um, still able to bring all the, the skills that I had developed on the mandolin to the octave mandolin. So it was sort of a, a, a journey over, you know, I started playing mandolin when I was about nine and then it, I didn't start playing guitar really until I was like 13 or 14 and then didn't get the octave mandolin until I was 16 or 17. So that it was sort of in those, in those teen years that I was figuring out like you, like you said, you know, how do I want to write music? What, what instruments am I gravitating towards to write my own songs? Do you feel like you need to make um, much of an adaptation going between the tuning of, you know, the fifth tuning of mandolins and, and, you know, and then going over to guitar and your interv intervals, your tuning is different. Is there a, you know, a mental adjustment that you make? Yeah, I, I guess I just... I've just leaned so heavily on my ear for as long as I, you know, have been doing music. And, you know, I think that's what I always try to encourage younger players to to just really work on developing your, your ear um, in terms of, you know, not getting so, so attached to the fretboard <laughs> that you can't um, hear an idea and then translate that. Um, if that makes sense. Um, I, I just think there's a lot of freedom in following your ear as opposed to following your fingers. Um, and so, especially being a singer, you know, it would be different if I was an instrumentalist, but but even still, I feel like some of my favorite instrumentalists say they always try to, to sing along. Um, like you have to try to sing your solo before you can play your solo. And um, so I think with that being said, um, there, there was ne weirdly never too much of a barrier there between switching between the guitar and the, the mandolin or the octave mandolin. Um, was songwriting always something that y you knew you wanted to do? I think it was always in me. And I think especially because of what I said about my mom writing songs as a hobby. I remember being, even before I started playing the mandolin, um, you know, I, I've been singing since I was, singing was what came first. Um, I've been singing for as long as I can remember since I was two or three years old. And so I think just because of that and seeing her typewritten lyrics strewn about the house, I sort of, as a kid, you know, you're exposed to that stuff and you think, oh, this is what people do. <laughs> this is normal uh, to write a song. And so I think maybe because of that, it was, it was in me for a long time but it really it wasn't until I was you know fairly far along with the mandolin and then you know like you said starting to pick up those other instruments that I really started to explore it for myself and realize that it was something that I wanted to do and I think 
simultaneously around that time, the artists that I was really drawn to um, were great songwriters. And so that was also, you know, Gillian Welch, Tim O'Brien, um, Nickel Creek, the, those early faves of mine. Um, I always really respected that they were great singers, great instrumentalists, and great songwriters, and that they put value in all three of those things, not just one. And so um, when I kind of looked at them and realized that, I was like, well, that's what I want to do. So I'm going to try this songwriting thing. Before you started writing songs with guitar, um, I'm curious what songs you learned to play um, on mandolin or banjo that might have influenced the direction of your eventual songwriting? Hmm. That's a good question. I feel like I learned so many Gillian Welch songs on the banjo that especially where I, it's funny, like my writing on the banjo is, is more limited or it feels more limited than my writing on guitar and mandolin because I know this might sound weird, but I, I just, I just know how to play the banjo by ear. Like I don't know really what I'm doing. Like I, I learned that instrument solely by ear. Like I can't, I know this sounds really weird to say, but I, I would like put my finger on a fret and be like, I don't know what note that is. Like it, it's like solely by ear. Whereas with mandolin and guitar, I know theoretically what I'm doing. And so I feel like I have a lot more flexibility there in terms of where I can go writing wise. But what's fun about having that relationship with the banjo is that sometimes when I feel stuck or in my own way uh, with writing on the mandolin or the, or the guitar, the banjo can sort of be this palate cleanser and almost just it'll it'll lead me to to different ideas that I might not have had on the other two. So it's like I, I once heard Bela Fleck say, actually, sometimes he likes to change tunings just so that he'll sort of trick himself into hearing new things you know if if, because your ear gets used to a certain tuning or a certain scale and sometimes it's it's nice to almost trick yourself into doing something something different um so yeah the banjo I can't remember how the question started but the banjo definitely offers me a different way in to the song oh Gillian Welch yeah I I was I was sort of learning a lot of her songs by ear. Um, I actually, in, on my very first record, um, my s- song up in her head, the the song, um, I quote her in in, I think the first verse. I quote her song, "My First Lover," um, which so I feel like that's just a, a little nod to her, especially at that time. You know, I was seventeen when I recorded that album and. I was just learning her songs and, and I feel like melodically and harmonically her records were really influencing the types of songs that I was writing. You know, my for instance, my song Tell Me True, um, which Tim O'Brien actually sings harmony on on the record, uh, is almost like a, you know, direct honoring both him and her. Um, and I feel like I would have written it after listening to to their records um you know and similar things happened with the mandolin where I would um like a, yeah I feel like it's almost more present in that my first record where uh it, it felt like listening to something and then being directly influenced whereas I feel like as I've gone on I've tried to just find find my own thing a little more well it's interesting you, you mentioned like Tim O'Brien I remember having a conversation with him about this once about also playing a lot of traditional music. And since you came out of, you know, a, a kind of a bluegrass background, there's a ton of obviously existing traditional music to learn and play. Um, did you feel any sort of pull back and forth between, you know, doing traditional music and writing your own? It honestly always felt pretty naturally balanced to me. Um, and I think that was maybe because of how those people that I looked up to sort of seamlessly integrated both in in their live shows and on their records, you know, I think maybe Tim initially was kind of the the great example of that for me where, you know, yeah, you can listen to his records and hear the 
the Celtic influence, the Irish influence, um, the traditional West Virginia influence that, you know, he comes from, but it's through his filter. And so it's not, it's very kind of seamlessly blended together. Um, and, you know, I think I was just always sort of drawn to that where it didn't have to be this black and white thing where it could sort of meld and you could make it your own. And um, it almost felt to me like by studying um, and being really entrenched in the tradition of folk music and bluegrass music that that would only strengthen my own songs when I started to go down that road uh, as opposed to not being rooted in anything. (laughs) Um, So yeah, it just, I think, I think bluegrass really is a great, um, you know, tradition for that reason. It really, uh, because it's so solidified in itself, but it also has this element of improvisation in the solos that take place, you know, when you're passing around a song, I think that that balance of here's the form, but there's freedom within the form, um, has, is why so many, bands have kind of come out of it to create their own music, you know, and create their own sound, you know, David Grisman, um, Punch Brothers, you know, it's like, it's such a good launching pad for, for that sort of thing. And so for me, the other element of that is growing up in central Texas and having like the Texas singer songwriter tradition on top of all that. I call it a bluegrass jam that I went to, but it was really so much more than that. It had, people would play bluegrass songs we play molly and tim brooks but then the next song would be a nancy griffith song or you know a john prine song and so i think all of that just was such a rich fountain of of music and it's not just one thing you know it's very multifaceted well i was thinking about this this uh coming out of uh traditional music and folk and bluegrass um uh and what a great uh, grounding that gives you in so many ways. Um, a, a, another aspect of that is just playing with other people. It's like people who grow up around that. Cause there's, just, there's a lot of people who learn guitar, learn any, any instrument. They mostly just do it by themselves sitting in their room. And then it's a real leap to get into the place where you can really play well with other people. Whereas, and, um, and that sort of scene that you're talking about, you know, learning to stay in the groove and grab a harmony and uh, play rhythm, good rhythm, and all those things are just sort of basic to it. Uh, I'm just wondering, do you feel like um, that is a major asset for you in terms of all the collaboration that you do as just sort of a, you know, a sort of grounding experience for you in music? Oh my gosh, yes, 100%. Um, You know, it's even just coming off of this American acoustic tour, um, you know, where I have been just playing catch up with my own live shows, just like everyone, you know, over the last year or so, I've been just doing my own shows with my band, which has been so fun and, you know, so rewarding. And then, but because of that, I haven't done a whole lot of collaborating live with other artists. And so, you know, even just coming off this this month with to to be on stage with Chris again, um, you know, he, he's maybe the most, uh, you know, what you're saying, where I you come out of a situation of of sharing music, of playing music with somebody else, and you just are like, wow, I I feel so challenged, but you know, you wake up the next day and you feel like you have more strength in your fingers or you have more um, control over your solo ideas and I really think that it's just so important to play with other people and as much as you can because yeah there is just only so much you can do by yourself and music is collaborative in nature you know it's it's communal in nature and it's meant to be sounds bouncing off of other sounds and rhythms bouncing off of other rhythms and um, and having fluidity with that. And um, yeah, I mean, I just, I feel so grateful that when I was 
in the thick of my my early years um, figuring it all out that I was just exposed to so many, you know, jams, so many collaborations. So, you know, s- people asking me to sit in, you know, I think there's so much growth in that. Um, and, you know, I think it says a lot, obviously, about the acoustic music community um, that there's even people that are willing to share their stage time with with others. Um, you know, for me at that point, a total unknown, <laughs> you know, getting to hop up on stage with my heroes was, you know, that was always the most that I would learn. And um, even how your body feels in that moment, you know, I think this is something that I feel like Julian Lodge sort of first um, made me aware of, you know, because he's so into the Alexander Technique stuff. And actually, I was when I was at NEC studying with Dominique Eade, she was very into that as well and brought a lot of that into my my singing but um you know just you know when you're playing music at home you're kind of hunched over and you're you're physically in this way that you know maybe it's almost easier to do it that way but then when you're out and you're standing on a stage maybe with a strap and all of that stuff affects affects the music and so yeah it's just sort of important to put yourself in as many different musical situations um because then you're just more flexible um and and it's just more fun (laughs) it's just more fun to to hear what other people have to say and you know try to just getting to to blend with other people is kind of what it's all about can you tell me a little bit about how you approach songwriting from a collaboration standpoint? It's funny because I actually was very closed off to the idea of co-writing for a long time because I really did, when I started songwriting, it was in my room alone um, with my instrument. And I it was really hard for me to imagine accessing that place of um, just you know, opening up your inner world to someone else, um, because that's just all through my teens, you know, for my first two records, really, those were all mostly either a couple of covers or written by myself. And yeah, it was, I was super closed off to it. Um, you know, management and labels would be like, all right, we want to set you up on these co-writes. And I was like, that just doesn't, that seems forced. Um, but, you know, as I as I grew older and, um, you know, I think I think a part of it was wanting to kind of find my own sound uh, first before I before I sort of opened that door up to I, I wanted to sort of feel solidified in what I was trying to figure out and what I was trying to do with my own music. And I felt there was a little part of me that felt like if I did that, if I co-wrote too early, I might just fall into other people's sound and and sort of sound like the writer that I was writing with as opposed to being able to bring my own voice to it. And so I'm actually really grateful that I had, you know, about 10 solid years of just writing on my own before I really started writing with other people. And, you know, I would say the main thing that really opened me up to to writing with other people was my project I'm with her with with Aoife and Sarah um I mean you know I was just at at that point I had made four solo records which I had done some co-writing on for a couple songs but never in like a a, a super entrenched way that I had with when when Aoife and Sarah and I went to write that record we were you know we were together for two weeks and then we were together for three weeks recording the record and it was very much a a team mentality um and at that point there was something very beautiful about letting like the ego part of myself that I I think I needed to sort of find my own sound I was able to like let that go um in the in writing with with them and it was um I learned so much and um I think the three of us you know we just had a really instant ability to 
let stuff go easily. And I think that's why it worked so well, you know, and also just vocally, you know, just immediate magic (laughs) vocally. Was there anybody in particular on that album who took the lead in songwriting? You know, I think we all brought ideas. We all brought starts to the table. And more often than not, whoever brought a start would wind up kind of kind of singing the lead on a song. Um, But it varied, you know, there, there were definitely instances when someone would start us kind of bring the initial idea and then we would realize like oh this actually works better if we flip the voices around and so and so take kind of takes the lead and um you know and I think that's what's so fun about writing with them is that there is so much flexibility and there's not like a it's not like a fixed oh so and so sings the the tenor I sing the lead this person sings the baritone like we can sort of flip flip around um depending on what the song requires and so um yeah it's been it really that writing with them and being in that band with them um it just it totally opened up my world um and how I think about creativity and and at the end of the at the end of the day just having so much fun making music with other people um you know I I think when I did come back to, you know, making World on the Ground after touring with them, I just, I feel like I had so much more fun because it was, because I had been through that process of, of not feeling such weight with every single idea and, and letting things go a little easier. And I think in a way it's like through that process, kind of almost getting to actually the real gist of of who I'm trying to be as an artist by um, not putting up walls. Um, Yeah, so I'm I'm grateful for for those two ladies for that purpose. (laughs) Do you have any advice for our listeners who play guitar and are writing their own songs? Follow your ear. Um, You know, it's because I have placed so much importance on all these different instruments. um, It's like my... My advice for the mandolin would almost be the same as my advice for the guitar, which is um, let your ear guide you. And I think that, you know, my my favorite thing to do, especially if, if someone is just getting started, is to put, like you said, what what songs or people influenced your your songs as an exercise, put on uh, pick a solo that you love learn it by ear, you know, and, and internalize it, fully internalize that solo just by ear and then, then translate it to, to the guitar, you know, just hum along with it, then translate it to, to the guitar. And then it's so much more, uh, circular. It's, it's, it's so much more, I feel like by doing it that way, there's so much more room for, infusing your own voice within it um, as opposed to just learning notes off a page Um, which don't get me wrong I think I think it's great to be able to read music and I encourage people to do that too but I just think there's a lot more a lot more potential for growth and depth um, and you know being aware of the rhythmic aspects of music too when you're thinking about the melody not on the page it just becomes so much more in the air of the moment when you're learning music by ear and so I would just really can't really stress that enough that's the end of part one of our conversation with Sarah Jarose. join us on patreon for part two of this episode where we discuss how Sarah prepares for songwriting sessions how her process has evolved over the years and how the Blue Heron Suite, her latest album, came to be despite and because of the pandemic. Check out that episode and more at patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus. The Acoustic Guitar Podcast is brought to you by the team at Acoustic Guitar Magazine. I'm your host, Nick Grizzle, joined for this episode by co-host Jeffrey Pepper Rogers. Our theme song was composed by Adam Perlmutter and performed for this episode by Jeffrey Pepper Rogers. The Acoustic Guitar Podcast is directed and edited by Joey Lusterman. Tanya Gonzalez is our producer. Executive producers for the Acoustic Guitar Podcast are Lizzie Lusterman and Stephanie Campos-Dalbroy. 
thanks to Sarah DeRose and her team for coordinating this interview and taking the time to chat with us today. If you enjoy this podcast and want to support us, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus or find the link in our show notes for this episode as a supporter you'll have access to exclusive bonus episodes along with many other special guitar perks and if you're already a member of our patreon community thank you so much for your support it really means a lot 